You're up. It's like it's so difficult to that people sort of they don't have friends. Like you, people don't have like they like you explain something but they're not they're not comprehending. Like uh, let's yeah. say let's say let's say I, I give Marshall that one. You say granite, granite, granite mm -hmm. has this but it, it has these uh, circles on it. Right? Let's say you take a rock. And then put it right, so you, right, and then it explodes, and then it turns soft. So there's so there's um there's those bubbles in it. So if it if it if it becomes hard immediately, so then you'll have those bubbles. But if it takes millions of years, you won't have those bubbles. But it can't it can't happen instantly. There's no way it can happen instantly unless like Hashem does it. You know. It, so therefore, <coughs> so therefore it has to take a lot of time. Depending on, on the thing that you're talking about, so the thing is that we see in granite. Granite is one of the rocks from the core that it, that um, that we see that we see the bubbles from the smash. What, whatever so whatever happened there, or the boy, however it happened, we see the bubbles. So therefore, and it's and there's no way there could be bubbles that happen in so in such a in such a long amount of time. So therefore, that's a proof that the, the world was created was therefore formed instantly, which is not possible. It has to take time, because if it, because it melts, now it has to become hot again. So therefore, that's proof that, that, that Hashem created the world. It's a simple way of proving it. Well, um, any, any proof that has to rely on something being possible or impossible, physically or scientifically, I would say is very, very, Weak. How do we know what's possible and impossible physically? Because we tried it a few times and didn't see it happen. How do we know what the conditions were like when it was happening? Uh, any proof, for or against, I don't care what the conclusion is, whether the conclusion that God created the world, the conclusion that it's natural, any conclusion that has to be based on a premise of what's, of what's physically possible and impossible is very, very weak. Let me tell you something that happened six months ago. You have atoms, and atoms make molecules. Not all combinations of atoms will make stable molecules. Uh, the understanding of chemistry for over 100 years has been each atom has a certain number of uh, uh, it has electron shells, and the extra, each shell has room for a certain number of electrons. It goes up by twos, 248, 16, 32. And when you get a collection of atoms, which when they share their electrons, all the shells are filled, shells that they have are filled, <coughs> so then it's stable. And if they're not, not, don't share, they're not filled, uh, they're not stable. So for example, you get uh, one atom with um, three electrons, one atom with five electrons. So when you put them together, you'll have eight to fill that shell. That's good. I like that. But if you try two fives and, um, and a three, and you get 13, you're not going to have full shells. That doesn't like that. That's been the rule, and then laboratory experiments have worn that out for 100 years. About six months ago, a guy at Stony Brook decided to try to make new compounds under 200,000 atmospheres of pressure. Now, don't be overly impressed. He says 200,000 atmospheres is trivial. You can do that in the lab with the left hand. At the core of the Earth, there are 5.6 million uh, 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 atmospheres of pressure. So 200,000 is nothing to get excited about. But they did it. Guess what? They made impossible compounds. Compounds that chemistry says is impossible. I, ah, you'll say. But look, that's under 200,000 pressures. Then they took off the pressure, and the compounds are stable. Well, that's not supposed to be. Because the, the shells aren't filled. Now, there's no explanation for that. It just so happens that something which chemistry said was impossible is possible. It just was wrong. That's all. This isn't evolution which is mired in the past of billions of years. That's what they say. This isn't um, uh, uh, astronomy or, or uh, uh, the origin of the cosmos and everything else. This is laboratory chemistry. And six months of the guy, like a gigantic shock. Any argument that starts with what's scientifically possible or impossible seems to me is very, very far off. Now, uh, there were people who wanted to use the flood and the weight of the water to say that causes things to look older than they do. I always used to say radioactive decay 
it doesn't seem is relevant to pressure. I didn't think pressure could affect chemistry at all. The electromagnetic bonds that hold molecules and atoms together are orders of magnitude more powerful than, uh, than gravity. So gravity is trivial when it comes to the structure. It turns out that that's not true. Uh, 200,000 pressure of the atmosphere is very little in gravitational terms. So uh, any argument that starts with possible, what's impossible is, to me, a very weak argument. And you find the bubbles in the granite, and okay. I'll tell you something else. Um, very often you'll have an argument concerning what's possible, what's impossible, what's reasonable scientifically, and if you, pay, if you don't pay very careful attention, you don't miss the fact that the item you're talking about has one description, and the ever evidence that you are looking at has a different description, or it's in a different circumstance. The Gemara says, don't, lie, don't eat lying on the right side, because maybe instead of going down the food pipe, it'll go down the windpipe. When you look at the anatomy of the, of the, the anatomy of the throat, you have the one pipe and the next pipe are vertically, one on top of the other. Neither to the right, neither one's to the left. So you say, well, if they're vertically one on top of the other, how could lying this way or lying that way make any difference? Neither one's to the right or to the left to make any difference. Okay. A lot of people are impressed by that. I was in South Africa 18 months ago. I was staying with a friend. He said to me, you know that Gemara. Well, I now have evidence to explain that Gemara. It's because my son had a terrible problem. He, w he woke up several times at night when he was, I don't know, four or five years old, <clears throat> choking to death. He was choking to death. We took him to the hospital, we saved him. It turns out, uh, I hope I'm getting the right and left right, but this, the, the moral is the same, that he was always lying on his right side. Never has was lying on the left side. Then he said, I talked to medics. When a person's choking, can't breathe, one of the things they do is stick a, a, a tube down his nose into his throat, into his lung, right? They only use one nostril. They never use the other nostril. Only one nostril. Why? Because one nostril works, the other nostril doesn't work. Why not? If the tubes are vertical and placed one on top of the other, and you go down, it makes absolutely no difference which side you go down because you're going to a vertical, a vertical display, right? But it does matter. One works, and the other one doesn't work. And then he said to me, look, you're looking at an anatomy textbook. We're talking about the actual experience of a human being lying on his side. Maybe things happen that li when you're lying on your side that aren't shown by an anatomy textbook. Maybe the muscles don't work the same way. Anatomy textbook doesn't tell you which muscles are stronger, which muscles are weaker, which muscles are controlled by which side of the brain, which side. None of that is, is included. All you see is the two tubes are there. You're assuming that if the two tubes are this way, it can't make any difference which, which way you lie. The only way to find out whether, way, whether lying on one side or the other makes a difference is lie on one side or the other and see if it makes a difference. Looking at an anatomy textbook doesn't settle that. Now, very often, people are making mistakes like that. You're talking about a real situation. You're looking at what's happening in a textbook, and you're saying, well, if it's like this, then it could, that couldn't happen. But you didn't try it in the real situation. There's a lot of weak stuff here. Uh, one collection of the materials is in Rabbi Meisman's book, Torah Chazal and Science, which I heartily recommend to anybody who has the zitzvah to go through a 900-page book. But it is filled with important information on these issues. I would not bring, I would not use that to, to any educated person, uh, especially if I'm educated in science, will find that very, um, very weak as a proof that God created the world. Still be, I mean, I, I think this is still the proof because, because if we're talking about such such heat, which which um, which now gives the ability for <coughs> which it can't instant it, 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 once it, even ten minutes or twenty minutes all the bubbles are gone. It takes uh, or maybe maybe even it's, it's sort of a, even let's say a day right one day. It takes it takes one day. For, for sure the bubbles to be gone. But maybe this, this granite was formed under a million atmospheres of pressure. It was formed near, near the core of the Earth. You didn't do any observations near the core of the Earth. You had observations on the surface of the Earth. Sure, but this, this, is the, this is part of the Earth, meaning without it, the Earth wouldn't be. I know, but so what? So you when you talk universe. about the bubbles forming and not forming, how do you know that? By looking at what happens in a laboratory here on the surface of the Earth. But maybe the properties that it has under a lot of pressure aren't the same properties. But it can't, there's no way you can get bubbles from, from being where it is. How do you know? 
You haven't taken a look there. You don't know what's going on there. That's exactly my example of lying on your side when you look in the anatomy textbook. I look in the anatomy textbook, well, you can't make a difference what happens when you lie on your side. You don't know that. You don't know that until you try lying on your side. Talk to an engineer. An engineer will tell you, until you build a prototype and watch it fly, you don't know anything. In fact, that you have a book and then equations and, and then this sort of thing and computer simulations, build one and let me see you fly. If you don't do that, we don't know that it's real or isn't real. You haven't done that. You haven't got any simulations of the conditions that we really were forming under. So you're, it's, it's guesswork. The statement that was before, that the original statement that, it, that these things were formed there, and therefore that's why it has the, the bubbles? I'm or? saying we don't know. I'm not, I'm not offering another, I'm not playing the same, same dumb game of I know how it happened. I'm saying since we have no observations of the process that really took place, anything we say about what could have happened that couldn't have happened is just guesswork. It's just guesswork. Because we're not talking about the actual situation. You know what it's like? It's like the, the evolutionists who say, you know that, that selection can make, cause small changes. Well, big changes are just lots and lots and lots of small changes. That's dumb. That's dumb. No one has ever seen lots and lots and lots of small changes. Then you don't know that there could be lots and lots and lots of small changes. You don't know that. You're just guessing. Right? There's no reason to, uh, to, to give, fold your cards because I say we, we saw a thousand, so when there's a trillion, this is what it'll be. You don't know that there can be a trillion. You need direct evidence for that. There isn't any evidence for that. So you're doing the same thing. I saw how granite behaves on the surface, and so it couldn't be any way different if it was underneath. You don't know that. It's just guessing. I don't like the arguments whether they support my position or don't support my position. I want good arguments. <laughs> it's not a good argument. Okay, other questions. This is open Q&A. In case nobody got the no title. Topics. Huh? No specific topics? No specific topics. I can't reveal tomorrow's closing Dow Jones Industrials, but other than that, um, yeah. Um, the Rambam and Hakos Teshuva uh, was talking about heaven and hell. And describing hell, he says it is a place where God takes revenge on those who, I guess, didn't follow his mitzvah. You're not talking about the Rambam. He says he used the word vihinokim the kama or so. Yeah. Exact lotion. But he doesn't mean hell. Doesn't say hell. Doesn't use any word that's convinced. Convinced okay. that what he says there is. He's talking about the opposite of olam haba. And the opposite of olam is annihilation. Okay. So Ceasing to exist. So then he's but that's not hell at all. Okay. Let's get straight. Let's get straight. I'm, I, I, we have to have some care for accuracy. Hell is a place where a soul suffers forever. That's a Christian idea. Although there's some references in Jewish sources to something similar. The Rambam knows absolutely nothing about that, doesn't mention it in any of his writings. It's completely absent. The, the nakama, the, the revenge that's taken on, on a soul, is, is that it's simply annihilated. It ceases to exist. Fine, that doesn't change my question. My question was, why does he, I know he, he was medactic on all his words. Why mm -hmm. did he use the term revenge? Why not punishment? Why not, you didn't earn your reward? The term revenge implies that you hurt me in some way. Right? If I'm taking revenge on you, it implies that you caused me damage now, I'm going to cause you hurt. You, and, and, right? and that's not punishment for breaking the rules. So why does he use the term nikama when describing this kares, this annihilation? The Ramam says in the guide, and he says it also very briefly in the, in the, in the Mishra Torah, he says it in the guide, that God has no emotions, God does not function out of emotion, and that all the descriptions that we have of God are descriptions of the actions that he performs. And the description works like this. A word is used. You as a human being ask yourself, well, what does that word mean for me in terms of my emotions? It means X. Well, if I had that emotion, how would I act? I would do Q. And with respect to God, it refers to Q. It's a way of communicating to a human being the kind of action that God will take. So the human being goes through a two-step st mental process. Let's take revenge. So God takes revenge. Says, what would revenge mean to me? Revenge would mean to me that I'm hurt and I'm angry and I'm going to act in a very serious, stringent fashion. I'm not going to have mercy. I'm not going to hear any arguments or any rationalizations. I'm going to carry you through. Okay, God is not hurt. God is not angry. God does not react emotionally to anything. God doesn't have emotions. That's growth amplification. It's as bad to say that God has emotions as to say that he has arms and legs. All of it is anthropomorphism. But if you want to know what kind of actions are going to come from God, they're the kind of actions that a human being taking revenge would perform. That's what he says in part one, chapter 54 of the guide. 
All those words with respect to God are only a way of describing for us the kinds of actions that will come out. So, still, why would he use such a word? Because he's explaining it to us in our perceiving of that word. Because this is the most drastic thing that can possibly happen. The most drastic thing that can, that can happen is that the soul ceases to exist. So he uses a term which in our language describes people carrying out drastic actions. But it's to describe the action. Same with mercy. He says, mercy means I see it, it hurts me. I can't stand the pain of, of watching this terrible thing, so I act to perform, I act to, to help. God doesn't feel the pain. God doesn't react in that way to anything. But the action helps, saves, um, um, uh, cares for, preserves, uh, relieves pain, and so forth and so on. The kind of thing I would do out of mercy, when God is described as merciful, it means these things will happen to the person. I'm not talking about God's inner life. Yes? Simple question. How would it progress from a conclusion that God exists to actual belief in him, belief in the context of a sentiment, something above the abstract? In other words, you know, based on Occam's razor or any rational logic or intellect, one can understand that it can't be another way, but it doesn't necessarily affect our feelings or how we live our lives or or trying to feel his existence, trying to have him real. Yeah. is not the result of an intellectual you know, conclusion. Okay, let, let me translate your words in, into words that I can understand, and then if, if you feel that I'm not answering your question, you'll tell me. Um, first of all, Occam's razor is not going to help you here. Occam's razor is usually used as an argument against God's existence, not for God's existence. So let, leave it out. You know, you know, William of Occam is not, your, is not your purview. You haven't studied him, and, and it's just something that people talk about. It's a buzzword. Uh, for, second of all, you don't really mean belief. If it's been delivered to me intellectually that such and such is true, then of course I believe it. There's a, bit di there's a difference between believing it abstractly on the one hand and, as you said at the end, feeling it and living it and being motivated by it and integrating it. I think that's what you're really after. Belief is seem, seems to be used generally as, as something more than an abstract concept. Something you could, like, you know, I don't think so. I, I don't think okay, so. Then, what, what I, I, for example, I mean? I'm a, here's an example that's relevant to your, to your question. Uh, many people believe things. They'll tell you not only do they believe them, but they know them, and yet they don't act on them at all. Like people who don't go to the dentist. And he'll tell you, I know that I'm hurting myself. I know it's going to cost me more pain and more aggravation and more money. That's about the stress. That's a real belief. That's and yet he isn't acting on it. He isn't. Okay, that's, he's, that's the third step. Acting on it is a separate thing. Well, but I, I don't want to know what you, you mean. Believe God, like I believe that not going to the dentist will hurt my teeth. That's what I'm looking for. Even if you don't go. Right. That's a separate thing. But then I said, what, what, what could it mean? Not. What could it mean that it was delivered to you by, the, by intellectual reasoning and you don't believe it? No, it's con the conclusion on paper, the conclusion based on argument, yes. will result yes. in God's existence. Right. That won't necessarily affect me. In what way? In a way that I, that I, that I feel it emotionally. Good, so that's exactly what I said. You don't have a gap between having it on a piece of paper intellectually and believing it. You have a gap between believing it and feeling it. Okay, belief means conclude then. That's, that's right. It means if you ask me what's true or false, the true and false test, I'll put down true because I know it's true. Okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't motivate me. It doesn't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't relate to it. I, you know, I, uh, I, re I rebel against it or I just don't, don't take it seriously. Um, I... And I think this is, a, this, is a serious, this is a serious question. Now notice, this is a psychological question. You phrased it specifically as a psychological question. Logic is all there, reasons are all there, and yet there's a disconnect between the logic and the reasons on the one hand, and my feelings about it, and my... I understand why it should be that way. I mean, it has to be that way because God is from his own family, one and infinite. Say again? Why, why, what should be that way? Well, it should be a disconnect? That's why there is a disconnect. Not that there ought to be, but it, it logically... For human beings to have a disconnect, even though they why his existence, why since we're we're so constricted and we're so far from God, being you know as we so that's so, why there should be a disconnect between that's why it's logical, logical why our minds can't grasp it in a way that that, that affects us emotionally. Well, because I'm not sure it. that the breakdown between logical belief on the one hand and a feeling on the other hand is a failure of grasp. Not sure that's a failure of grasp. Most concepts that we understand, we're, we have some sort of connection to. 
we could observe or, or at least our brains could, could, could fathom it, could compute the numbers or the evidence. I mean, the result of God is that he's something that you can't fathom, you can't. Go. Yeah, but, but then, no, I don't, think that's the, I don't think that's the problem. Take a smoker. He smokes. You show him the research, it's over the so on. He looks at it. He says, I, I can't find anything wrong with it. And I suppose it's right. I mean, I have no, no way to, sh to avoid the conclusion, but I smoke. And it doesn't bother him. It doesn't Addictions bother him. are very tough examples. Okay, let's say so. But there are examples of people who know, and the solution for him is not going to be a better grasp. Not more studies, more calculations, more testimonials. That's not going to be the solution for him. It's got a breakdown between the head and the heart, which the Muslim movement specialized in. The Muslim movement specialized in this. Addiction undermines logic. In most cases in, in life, we don't have something getting in our way. To but it doesn't have to. But it doesn't to have to undermine logic. There are times when a person's addicted and he'll say, and it's not dangerous. But that's not always the case. There are times when people will say, yes, I understand it's dangerous. You can take, uh, test me with, a, with the truth serum, and you'll see that I'm not lying. I do, I do really believe it's dangerous. I just, sometimes they'll say, I can't afford to care about that. I can't afford to care about that. I can't afford to take that seriously. It's just not, not on my plate. And, and he goes on, he sleeps well, he continues to smoke, and he just keep, goes on with his life. Disconnect between the head and the heart is not a matter of grasping it better. It's not a, question, not a matter of sharpening your intellect. That's taking an example when you could grasp it and it still doesn't affect your emotions. But I think that it is logical that since we don't grasp God, that would be another reason why it won't affect our emotions. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but there are people where the belief in God does affect their emotions. That's the question exactly how they know. Okay, but you know that it's true. I know it's true. And so that then it shows that you by your own logic that it can't be through greater grasp, because you're positing that God's beyond human grasp. No, that's just why I understand why even though we can... But that can't be the right understanding, because if it was the right understanding, then no one would feel it. Maybe well, there definitely is a way to work on it. To work on the grasp? To work, to work on the, the emotions without grasp. That's my point. But you said before you're, you're, that, the, the, what, that it's because we don't grasp it that we don't feel it. If that were true, the only way to work on it would be to get a better grasp. Now you just said that you understand that since some people do feel it, and it's not because of grasp, because God is beyond all grasp, there must be a way to get to the emotions without grasp. That's where I've been trying to lead you for the past five minutes. The, the starting point is, I'm just the way I understand the starting point of a conclusion of God without feeling it, without having an emotion about him, is because we're, we're discussing something that's so hard to make real to us. But, but now you've used a different vocabulary. Before you talk about grasping, grasping is an intellectual term. Make real is vague enough to cover emotions and behavior and, and the stock market. But make real, and there I'm, I'll be closer with you. Let's take music. Music affects people. How many people understand anything about music? Can they write music? Can they know the difference between minor and major keys? Can they follow the themes that's over the song? They just feel something. We experience God like we experience music. No, but that's not the point. You're skipping from point to point. The point here is that nothing about intellectual grasp has any effect on feeling it. I'm pointing out to you that intellectual grasp is not the key to feeling. In some cases, it might help, but there's no block to feeling something because I don't have an intellectual grasp of it. Okay, now we're in a different field. Okay, so we're now to have, okay but you, you keep jumping from point to point, you know, and uh, I'm the kind of person who wants to work systematically and know where we are. So it's not the failure to grasp God that is standing the way of feeling. Many people do feel God, and they don't have any, any better grasp because you're positing God is beyond the human grasp. So that's not the problem. And it's not the problem generally in life. There are things that we, that we feel very uh, deeply, and we don't understand at all, because feeling opposite on a different level. And the whole Muster movement was based on the gap between the head and the heart, where the head can understand perfectly well, and the heart doesn't follow anyway. And I gave you examples of that as well. So I, I'm suggesting to you, for all those reasons, that you shift your focus away from grasp to something else. Now, there are psychological blocks. There are psychological blocks which, where a person feels under threat, and he feels under threat, so then he either perverts his logic or gerrymanders his feelings because he's afraid of what the feelings will do if he, if he, uh, if he has those feelings. Sometimes that's useful. Some people train themselves not to be too afraid. The fear overwhelms them. Neurotic fears. People can't fly in airplanes. So there are therapies training them not to be so afraid. 
Now, when people don't have feelings, there are ways to stimulate those feelings as well. Um, for one thing, a variety of experiences can help. Uh, a person who feels indifferent towards poverty, just doesn't think about it, take him on a tour of impoverished regions of the world, and he may come to feel very differently about it because he saw it firsthand. Or, if he reads the right literature, one of the great things that, that authors do is to give people vicarious experiences without traveling to India. But if you read it and you get involved in it, it sucks you in and you identify, and you have these, what are called audience emotions, secondary emotions, those two can stimulate feelings that you, that you otherwise wouldn't have. So there are certain types of meditations that people can do. You, uh, you receive a love letter. What will people do? They'll take it out and read it again, and read it again, and read it again. Because every time they read it, those feelings come flooding back. So that's just running your eyes across a piece of paper with black marks on it. But that can stimulate those feelings. Music can stimulate those feelings also. Dance can stimulate those feelings also. It's not a, an accident that Jewish practice is based on repeated um, group activities. Um, think of Aliyah Larego, the three pilgrimage festivals in the, in the Torah. Three times a year, you come to Yerushalayim with at least hundreds of thousands of other Jews, and you say hallowed together with thousands of other Jews. That's a happening. You know, you talk about street fairs and so on and so on. So hundreds of thousands of people. And look at what the Torah invested in. If you live in, in, in uh, uh, Tzvas or you live in Dan, for, further north, it'll take you a week to get here and a week to go back. That's six weeks on the road. For a farmer, six weeks on the road is a big investment. And he comes for time to spend the Yerushalayim with hundreds of thousands of other people. That group feeling is something which the Torah invests in, because that group experience, because the group experience delivers a certain type of feeling. With a multitude of the people, the glory of the king is manifest. It means you feel the glory of the king in a way that you don't feel it at any other time. I can testify to this because, since I learned in Dafyomi, and because my wife is a tzedekist, she engineers that I should go to the CMHS. We did it now three times in America. This last time was at MetLife Stadium with 95,000 people. When 95,000 people say Shema together, that's something. When they answer Kaddish together, that's something. Uh, it's something you won't feel anywhere else. You won't hear anyplace else. We don't have it that often. That's every seven years. They had it three times a year. But the investment in that Simchas Torah, when you are together with a group of people whom you feel very close, and very interesting, the music that you sing vocally on Simchas Torah without any band is usually much more powerful and much more uplifting than the big bands that you have as far as Simchas Beis on the on the Cholamoid. I'm not against bands. Bands are wonderful. But somehow, that's an experience which you carry with you for a whole year. So experiences are generated by um, emotions and which can be generated by reading, by meditating, by exp having various types of experiences, um, and particular group experiences which, which help to stimulate those emotions. Also, I mean, this is included in what I said, but it's another application. Uh, exper uh, experiences and emotions are, are um, communicable. They're contagious. If you are around people having an experience, then you have the experience also. There are people who have superb Audiovisual systems at home. Uh, they watch a football game, three screens going, and they've got uh, the sounds and everything else. Why would anybody with that kind of equipment pay a ticket to go to the game? You've got to travel there an hour and park even standing in line and everything else. Why would he bother to do that? The answer is that when a goal is scored and 50,000 people leap to their feet screaming, it feels different in the stadium than it does at home. Even with quadraphonic sound blasting in your ears. When you're standing together with 50,000 people, it feels differently. And they go to have that feeling. If you are around people who experience God, and experience the Torah, it leaves an indelible mark on you. I know, because I had this with my Rebbe Zatzal for decades, people who saw him do certain things, it's, it's just planted in your, in your heart. You, and you can't, uh, you don't want to uh, avoid it, but it's, it's there. So it's make, it's make Kiddush. When you make Kiddush Friday night, the overwhelming feeling you had was, this is the last Kiddush. Nothing morbid. He'll be here next week. But this Friday night is only going to come once. You only have one opportunity, one job. After this Friday night, it's gone forever. So 
Make it good. This is the only shot you have at this Kiddush. You felt that every time he made Kiddush. You saw him say goodbye to the sukkah. He kissed the walls, climbing the ladder to kiss the schach. It was breathtaking. It was breathtaking. He didn't do anything uh, demonstrative, but you saw the, the heart that he put into the mitzvah and the bidding goodbye to the mitzvah. And especially when he got older, there was even more poignancy in it. So if you're, if, you're, if you're associated with people and have the opportunity to be together with people who have these emotions, it's also a way to come to feel the emotions. Um, so that's, that's akin to the Musra idea of, uh, uh, of finding ways to bridge the gap between head and heart. Um, I heard this story about, about with Dessler, and he became Meshkiach in, 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 um, in Panovich, in, in Breivak, it was a Rosh Hashanah, and they had a generator, and the generator wasn't that strong. So between the first day and second day, they turned it off for a few hours. So it was getting dark, and the generator wasn't on, so the guys couldn't learn. So they asked Odessler to, to speak. I believe I heard this in the neighborhood of Rosh Shapiro, who was there. And Odessler got up, and he, and, he, and he quoted a Chazal, a statement from the Talmud. And repeated it, repeated it, and repeated it, and repeated it. And they said, after 50 times, you thought you were hearing it from Rashi. And after 200 times, you thought you were hearing it from Rav and Shmuel. And after 500 times, you thought you were standing at Sinai. Everybody knew that Chazal, but they didn't experience it. They didn't experience it. We hear the words over and over and over again. Ah, you'll tell me, you'll have the love of those being told me the Torah, you know, that it's like a mantra and so on and so on. I don't care what it's like. Maybe it is like. Human psychology could be similar across the board. But here, you're using it for Kedusha. You're talking about getting it into the heart. Now, um, th so that's what the Muslim movement did. They used to s say together, 200 guys saying together things in a mournful tone of voice. And I'll end with a famous Muslim joke. Uh, uh, a guy whose son is in this Muslim yeshiva, and he's not particularly involved in that movement. So he's like, visit his son in the yeshiva. And he comes during the Muslim Seder, and uh, the boys are sitting there saying, I am nothing. I'm nothing, I am nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Looks at them, 180 boys. I'm nothing, I'm nothing. It's 180 boys. So he shoot. The father thinks, okay, I'll try. So he sits down, starts saying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. One of the boys stops and says to him, you don't get to be nothing so fast. <laughs> Of course, that kills the Musser, and that kills the heart, and it kills the emotion, and it kills the Yiddish guy, and everything else. Okay, there are, there's plenty of room for self-deception. The Torah is mature enough to laugh at itself. Our Torah life is mature enough to laugh at itself. But there's no doubt that there's something very, very precious there. Um, and this is something which, these are techniques that are used. You're dealing with a psychological block, and the psychological block needs psychological and behavioral tools to overcome it. It's not a question of greater grasp. Next question. That was enough on that question. What else is? Yeah. If you could recommend one book or one safer, well, maybe there isn't one, but you know, instead of going through hundreds and hundreds of books, someone who can, you know, one or two, three books, it's from that you would recommend to go through to get like a, a basic, you know, fundamental understanding of the Torah as a whole. Of no, more, more of like a philosophical approach to God, not, you know. Okay, the book is The Way of God by Lutzato, Terah Hashem. Um, there are a number of editions of it out. I won't comment on the rest of them, but uh, one came out a year ago from Feldheim. Um, the translator and editor and commentator is a Rabbi Abba Tzvi Neiman. I know him because I learned with him uh, in the mirror about 100 years ago. Um, he's an excellent scholar. He knows all the writings of the Ramchal, including the Kabbalistic writings. He wrote a very voluminous um, commentary on it um, in straightforward, plain language, but very well done. And the translation is done in a very sensitive way. Also, I have 40 hours of shurim on the Derech Hashem, which are on my website. So uh, what I would recommend for somebody to do is this. Take this safer. It has a, a detailed table of contents in the, in, in the beginning. Pick out the parts that are interesting to you. And just read them quickly. Just get an idea. 
how the author writes and the kinds of things that he talks about and the kinds of uh, references that he uses. You get into some familiarity with the rabbi. Then, if you have the strength, go back through the book. Omit the few things that aren't interesting at all, things that you know you don't want to hear about, theurgy, using God's names to stimulate things to happen in, you know, from angels. Maybe you're not interested in that. But read the book through quickly, get an idea of the overview of the book, and then go through it slowly. In my shiurim on it, 40 hours worth, I, I bring in a lot of other stuff which is relevant to the general ideas. Uh, my name is closer to the text itself. Um, and I think from that you'll probably get the widest um, lens with the deepest references uh, that you'll get anywhere else. Now, Moshe Chaim uh, first of all, he was a master catalyst. Second of all, I think essentially he was a philosopher. I think essentially he was a philosopher. Now, other people probably don't agree with me. I'm probably just expressing my prejudice because I'm a philosopher. But I have talked to other people about this. He asks questions that you don't find anywhere else. He offers observations that you don't find anywhere else. You probably have heard, many of you, maybe all of you, that God is constantly giving the world its existence moment by moment. We say it twice after Baruch in the morning. Mechadesh, Tomit, Maisebrashis. Constantly making the world new. Okay, that's a fundamental article of Jewish belief. Nobody disagrees with that. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? He didn't have to. He could have made it to go on by itself. He's all powerful. Nothing problem. No problem. No problem. With that. Why does he do that? Find me anyone else who asked that question. Who asked that question? I would try to ask that in, a, in an essay which is not translated. In fact, it's an essay that has three Mamar al Chachma. And it's an essay that has three different versions and only one version. But he asked the question. And he gives an answer which. You have to be a little to answer. He says, the goal of existence for a human being is dvekus, is attachment to God. In order to be able to attach with God, God has to be available. If he creates the world and sets it up to run an automatic pilot and retreats to some Valhalla, he's not present. He's not available. By constantly recreating it, his rotzon, his will, is operating in your world continuously. That's how he's available for dvekus. That's what he says. Some of you have heard about the four worlds in, in the mystical writings, four, four worlds. Uh, Atzilus, Bri, uh, Yitzir, and Asiyah. Animation, formation, creation, and... Uh... Inadequate, uh, inadequate uh, English translations. Okay. The Tato says one of them isn't a real world. One of them isn't a real world. You know, somebody said that and wasn't identified. They shoot him! He, the whole of the Kabbalah says there are four worlds. There aren't. Well, the Tato says, what is a world? When's the last somebody asked that question to you? What is a world? That's a philosopher's question. A world is a group of entities that interact with one another. On the three bottom worlds, you have that because you have creations. On the world of Bria, you have human souls. With Yitzira, you have angels. On the world of Asiya, you have the whole of the physical, physical realm. You have creations. On the world of Atsilas, which is the top of the four, there are no creations. No creations. Creations start one level down. Ah, you'll tell me, but in that world there are spheros and partsufim and all the things that the Kabbalists talk about. So the Tzato, sure, the Kabbalists talk about it, but really it's only achtus, it's only one. The multiplicity of various items is just the way they interact with me, the way they affect my intellect. But truthfully, there's only one thing there. And since there's only one thing there, it's not a world, and therefore it isn't a world. It isn't a world. The word world is used just uh, by borrowing. It's a borrowed word. But it's, the Tzato... Is, a, is an essence of philosopher. He cares about definitions, he cares about concepts, he cares about explanations. Um, God created us in his form, B'Tselem Elohim, in his likeness, Demus. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? Why wasn't God satisfied with horses? In the Hashem, he has an answer. Because he traces everything back to first principles, and he doesn't say, well, it's a verse in the Torah, so that's enough. No, 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 but... What does that reflect? What's behind that? What's the reason for that? He's, he's really a philosopher. So what you'll have is an organized presentation. Now, I don't claim that all of it's easy to read, uh, but, but if you want one book, that's the one book. That's that, why I spent so much time learning it. And that's why I spent so much time teaching it. I've taught it many times. The two essays you mentioned, one about uh, Oisimat, Tambid, uh, continually renewing 
you said that one isn't in Derek Hashem. You said it's untranslated. So it assumes to mean... To yes, that's, it's, it's called Ma'amar al Um But again, it has three versions. I, and I, have two, I have two of them, and, and one it is and one it isn't. So I, I don't know how to tell you what to do. If you have access to DBS, the one with DBS has it. You know what DBS is? It's a computerized uh, collection of basic Jewish writings, which has, I don't know, thousands for them or something, and has all, all, the, all the major material. And it has, uh, it has the, the, the Marmar of Chachma. Um, the other essay about one about the four worlds. Yeah, that's, that's in the Zerach Hashem. That's actually the Zerach Hashem in the, in the Perik on Tefillah, on prayer, in the fourth part, where he talks about the four parts of prayer and how the four parts of prayer the sacrifices, and then the Psalms, and then Shema, and then the Shema Esrei, parallel the four worlds. And in that context, he just mentions, by the way, the top world is in the world, because the world's not worked that way. That's all. Yeah. Lutzato is really uh, is thrilling in that way, and he, uh, he wrote all over the world. We don't have everything that he wrote. Um, he wrote plays. Some of the books that he wrote wrote in dialogue. Das Tunis was written in dialogue. Um, and he died at the age of 39. It's just, uh, I can't imagine how somebody lived as much as he did and died at the age of 39. Yeah, what else is on your mind? Uh, the Stella doesn't, doesn't hear for, for reason. Yeah. So, how would you make, how would you? Give him a sense of care for reason. Who is this? Yeah, I'll tell you, this is an interesting, interesting question because the person may say that and may present themselves that way, but it's surely not true. It's surely not true. If his car doesn't start in the morning, he's not going to go and feed it a hamburger. Why not? He said, because it needs oil. But that's reason. I don't care about reason. No, I'll feed it a hamburger. He's not going to feed it a hamburger, right? And if he, uh, if he comes home and he finds that uh, the... Uh, gas was on and, and uh, the uh, uh, tiles of the, you know, the paper in the kitchen is ignited, he's not going to go and get gasoline and pour it on. Why? Because it's not reasonable? He doesn't care about reason. Why pour gasoline? No, pour on water. Why? Don't give me, give me, give me a break. There's no one who's just not reasonable. Doesn't care about reason. Ain't the said that's, that's a fantasy. But what? In certain areas, he doesn't want to use reason. So then there's a block. Just like the block I was talking about before, but here now is a behavioral block. Right? Uh, sometimes, as he said before, it'll pervert the person's logic. Because I know reason will lead me to this conclusion, I can't accept the reasoning. He at least wants to be consistent, and he knows he's going to be stuck. That's like a smoker who says, those studies, they're all made by communists because they're against the tobacco companies. It's all phony. It's all made up. There's nothing wrong with cigarettes. That's a person so afraid of the conclusion, he's got to deny the reasoning. That's Good. That's good. A person who rationalizes is, is in a good position because it means if you could deprive of his rationalization, he knows he's got to change. That's why he's protecting himself. The person who says, I know and I don't care, is in a much worse position. He says, oh, the logic is there. So the, the person says, I don't care to be rational. And, oh, and, and there's another thing you can do here. This is a trick that you can play not only with rational, but with any question of value or, or, or responsibilities. People say, nobody tells me what to do. I don't have any responsibilities. You can't force me into your values and so forth and so on. OK, that's the kind of silly stuff that college students say. Okay, But now I ask you, George borrowed your car. You went away for a month. You came back. And you find it wrapped around a tree. You say, George, what happened to my car? I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I was driving it, and I felt that the brakes were getting loose, and, you know, and they, they weren't working properly. So you say, oh, so what did you do? You took it to a room mechanic. Said, no, I don't go to mechanics. Nobody pushes me around. I do my own stuff. I read the book myself. I fixed it myself. You say, but what happened? Well, I guess <laughs> when I fixed it myself, it didn't get fixed, and, um, and um, it ended up wrapped on a tree. You say, well, you're a crook. You're the... Now, when he says to you, you can't tell me I have responsibilities. You can't push your values on me. You can't tell me what I have to do. Are you going to be persuaded? Say, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to tell you what to do. Sorry. Perfectly all right. The car's destroyed. Go your happy way. No, I think you want your car. And you're going to tell him, you took my car, then you owe me that you should behave in a responsible fashion. 
So a person who's very careful to protect his freedom and not be told what to do when somebody owes him something gets on the other side of the horse and he says, excuse me, there are rules and regulations, responsibilities, and all the rest. This was brought out by a, an article in the Wall Street Journal many, many years ago, maybe you know, like 60 years ago, uh, where a professor is teaching a course in ethics. And uh, the professor gave various arguments that ethics is binding, ethics is objective. A student writes a paper with the opposite thesis, that uh, that is not binding, it's not objective. And he argues against all the professor's arguments, and he, and he, and he says, I therefore hold that ethics is personal, individual, you know, subjective. Gets an F, failing mark. So he storms into the professor's uh, office, and he says, why did you give me an F? So the professor said, well, because I proved that ethics is, is objective. And the student says, yes, but I answered all your proofs. Well, says the professor, when people don't agree with me, I fail them. That's what I do. I fail them. See? F! Signed. So the student says, but you can't do that. You can't do that. That's not fair. That's what our university is about. That's what grading is about. You're lying. You're cheating. Uh-huh. The student saying that to the professor? The student's telling the professor he can't do that? The student's telling the professor he's cheating? The student telling the professor he's lying? How can he do that if ethics is really subjective, really individual, really it's only what I think, think what I care about and what I feel? Who's he to tell the professor what he should? The professor says, my values are, I, find, I fail the students who disagree with me. The student's reaction shows that he doesn't really believe what he wrote. There's something, as someone made the bitter contrast between a philosophical doubt and a serious doubt. They are different. They're different. One is, a philosophical doubt is, prove me wrong, otherwise I have a right to doubt it. And the other is, I really don't know what's right and wrong. I don't really know what's true. I'm really in doubt. Those two are not the same at all. The first is a debater's point, and the second is, how do you live your life? So uh, I think when a person says, I don't, uh, I don't trust reason and so forth and so on, Ask him how he will deal with other people who owe him responsibilities, who are, have uh, caused him losses and damage on the grounds that I just didn't feel like being reasonable. I think you'll have a very different attitude towards it. So I, I think this is a pose. It's not, it's, it's not really serious. It's just something to say to get you off his back. Now, maybe if he says that, you should get off his back. <laughs> maybe he's just not willing to listen to you. But seriously, for a person to say, I'll tell you one more. Um, I was in South Africa, this I think was like four years ago. There for Schwuz. Schwuz in South Africa is murdered because the night is 14 hours long. Now, over here it's six hours long. Before you know it, it's Shachris, you already know. I gave three hour and a half shiurim. I had plenty of time left over to do the afiomi. And that was unbelievable. So I give the first year. At the end of the first year, a guy comes up to me and says, Rabbi, what are you trying to do? You're trying to use reason to convince us that the Torah is correct. Don't you know that reason is only a Western cultural form? It's not universal. It has no objective validity. It's just something which you happen to do. And therefore, using reason carries no weight. And then he says, and don't use reason to answer me because that's begging the question. I showed you the reason has no, has no validity. Well, fortunately, fortunately, divine providence, a few months before I had read one of Thomas Nagel's classics called The Last Word. So I said to him, tell me, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to give me a reason to doubt reason? Is that what you're trying to do? If you're trying to give me a reason, then I can use reason to answer you. And if you're not trying to give me a reason, then leave me alone. Go play the saxophone. Why should I listen to you? You're not trying to give me a reason? What are you trying to beat me up? You know, bribe me with ice cream? You're not trying to give me a reason? Why should I listen to you? Any discourse, any discussion, any debate is based on the use of reason. Otherwise, it's not discourse, discussion, or debate. Reason is something you can't escape. You can't climb outside of reason. The attempt to climb outside either will be an abandonment of reason altogether. If so, why are you talking to me? How do you expect me to respond? Why should I respond at all if you're not trying to use reason? And if you are trying to use reason, then of course I can use reason to answer you.
We're talking the language of reason. So all of this is, is a false pose. It's something which uh, you can't, you really can't escape. This is the lesson that, one of the lessons that uh, Nagel took from Descartes. One of Descartes' arguments where a thing binds itself is one of the things that Descartes did. He transposed it into this, into this uh, area. Um, I'm a big fan of Thomas Nagel. I'm a big fan of Thomas Nagel. I think I read just about everything he's written, and, uh, and I'm a big fan. Anyway, this was a very useful, very useful thing. So a person says, I'm just unreasonable. It's not, it's not uh, something which can be taken seriously, and it's probably just a way of you know, saying to you, I don't want to talk to you. So if you can continue to talk and show them some of the things I've just told you, fine. And if, if not, then just give it up. You're just not listening. No point in talking to people who aren't listening. Yeah. If my service of God is motivated solely by my desire to feel gratified, how is that considered the service of God? Well, there are two problems here. First of all, it's purely selfish motivation does not disqualify service. A person who serves God only to get reward in the world to come and not to uh, be punished in the world to come or punished in this world, his service is valid. After all, God does promise reward and threaten and punishment. That's one of our fundamental principles. And if that motivates him to do the right thing, it's low level in quality, but it is valid service. Um, selfish motivation does not invalidate service. I'm not quite sure why it should. But your case is more subtle because if you say motivated by my, my desire for, for gratification, you have to ask yourself why this would gratify you. Why would this give you gratification? There's a famous argument by Bishop Butler, who was a, an Anglican bishop in, Brit in Britain, uh, writing about altruism, and I've used it many times in my shirim, it's, on, it's, on, it's on, on record. But the crucial thing here is this. Gratify is like satisfy. Gratify and satisfy presuppose antecedent, independent motivation. You can only satisfy a desire. If you had no desires, there wouldn't be any satisfaction. Satisfaction means satisfaction of desire. So then, what's motivating you is the desire. You can't be solely motivated by getting the satisfaction. Because the satisfaction is the satisfaction of a desire which is already a motivation for something else. All satisfaction or gratification is built on an antecedent motivation which is aimed at something else. So then you have at least two motivations. You have the motivation that getting gratified or satisfied, and then you have the pleasure of gratification and, satisf and satisfaction. It could be the reason you get gratification from serving God is because you want to serve God. And then one desire that's motivating you is the desire to serve God, period. And that's not selfish at all. In other words, gratification and satisfaction can't, they're not like root pleasures, like the pleasure of ice cream. The pleasure of ice cream you can have with no desires at all. It can be antecedent to all desires. You've never tasted ice cream, you don't know what to expect. One taste and you're hooked, especially vanilla. And you're hooked forever. Right? Because the pleasure is, so to speak, hardwired. But pleasure and satisfaction aren't hardwired. It depends upon a prior desire. Take, for example, uh, winning a game of chess. For most people, <clears throat> the only satisfaction in winning a game of chess is because I want to win. If I didn't want to win, I wouldn't have any satisfaction at all. It would, would bore me. I'd rather be, you know, playing in the sand if I didn't want to win. Or races or other, other competitive things. The, the reason you get such a charge out is because you want to win. Take a case like this. You're playing with your nine-year-old nephew because you want to interest him in chess. So your plan is, I'm going to artfully lose the game, make it close and lose the game, and then say, to him, wow, you, you're pretty good. You, know, you, should, you should play more often. You have talent. right? But poor you. He's so clumsy. He's so careless. He moves his, 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 his uh, rook into check. He says, oh, I just lost my rook. Now what are you going to do? Not take the rook? He sees that he lost the rook. <laughs> so, and he just clumsily loses the game. Are you going to get any satisfaction out of winning that game? I don't think so. Your goal was to lose it to encourage him. You didn't succeed in that goal. Winning the game against your nine-year-old nephew has no value to you. So there, there's a whole structure of, of psychology where the, the desire comes first 
And when you satisfy the desire, you get, as a result, satisfaction and, uh, and gratification as a, as a byproduct of satisfying the desire. But what satisfies the desire is what the desire is after, whatever it happens to be after. As a, I'm summarizing that something which usually takes me three quarters of an hour. So I think when, if, you, if your desire is desire for satisfaction, you've got to, or gratification, you have to recognize that there's another desire that satisfaction and gratification is built on. And that desire uh, may very well be a desire to serve God. So you haven't pre presented a case that's coherent. Yes, I, don't, I don't understand why it's necessarily caused by a desire to serve God. No, no, but, I, but you have to investigate. You have to now explain your cases. You, you painted it as if it's a, it's a one, there's only one thing that's motivating me, and that's the satisfaction, and that's selfish, it's only for me. And therefore, you asked whether that can be, uh, can be a matter of, serve, uh, of true, true service of God. I'm pointing out to you that your, your description is necessarily incomplete. If there's any satisfaction available at all, that's be another desire that's being satisfied. Now, you need a range of cases where you consider what those other desires are, and then put the, take the complex and ask the question again whether, um, whether it will be uh, about the service of God or not. I think the most natural thing to do is make the other desires purely selfish, and then you're back to where we started from. The person does it for, for reward and, not for, uh, and to avoid punishment. And that, all the Svarim agree, is perfectly valid service of God. Even if for instant fulfillment, not just for reward in the world to come? Well, then it would just be dumb because you're not going to get it. That could be your desire, but you're not going to get it. Feeling of fulfillment. <laughs> fulfillment is only when you get what you want. If you don't get what you there's want, you lack. won't be fulfilled. There's, there's a lack because you've devoted yourself, you've been indoctrinated that you'll be missing something without doing that. If you can't you be indoctrinated that white is black, right? I don't mean indoctrinated in a false term. But, but you're not going to get the, 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 the reward in the, in, 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 immediately. It's not going to happen. The sense of fulfillment you will get. Again, fulfillment is only when you have a desire that got fulfilled. If the desire was a desire for immediate uh, reward, it's not going to be fulfilled. It's not going to be fulfilled. There'll be no fulfillment there. If that, that desire, that lack, you're searching for the purpose of, for the feeling of, of you know, some significance. Okay, so we're back. Okay, you have to think about this. Fulfillment is, by definition, fulfillment of a desire. It only happens when the desire actually gets its object. I asked you for the underlying desire. You said the underlying desire is desire for reward. And not in all of my but immediately. That desire is not going to be fulfilled. It's not going to. But you said that. Okay, if you didn't mean it, then we can go on to another slot. Okay.